Thanks, Charlotte. <clears throat> so I'll uh, again wrap up yesterday's uh, lecture briefly and then dive into a new um, problem setting and show you another type of multi-scale uh, system that we have recently analyzed <clears throat> by asymptotic methods. So the take home messages from yesterday, uh, we started <clears throat> Uh, from the compressible flow equations that I show here again, I argued why the meteorologists would like, for different reasons, to have equation sets that don't uh, represent sound waves because they can they are unimportant and they make problems in numerics, um, and <clears throat> so they suggested two reduced models. One is called the unelastic, the other the pseudo-incompressible model. And formally, you obtain them essentially by dropping either the time derivative of density or the time der derivative of pressure from the uh, compressible equation. <clears throat> and the question that I uh, posed together with uh, colleagues was what is the range of length and time scales over which these equations are meaningful and um, what is the asymptotic validity. And then um, I showed you that this question is non-trivial in the sense that in the asymptotically speaking, when we have our small epsilon from the first lecture, then in the full compressible equations, <clears throat> the critical processes, advection, internal waves, and sound appear with three time scales, each pair of which is separated asymptotically by a certain power of epsilon. And you only want to get rid of the fastest modes, but not of the slower two modes. And so you end up with a system at the end that still has two asymptotically separated timescales in them. And that makes the analysis sort of complicated. Then I showed you how one can at least say something about um, the f these internal wave modes in comparison between R, A, the reduced system that doesn't have sound, that's the unelastic or pseudo-incompressible, and B, the full system that does have sound, and we can show that the uh, mode, eigenmodes, the internal eigenwave eigenmodes of both systems stay close to each other if the stratification of entropy in the background that is responsible for supporting the waves um, is has a certain weakness, but it's not too weak. Actually, the models remain, uh, the, the internal waves remain close over the slow and longest time scale if we have a stratification over the lower 12 kilometers of about 40 Kelvin, which is what is observed and realistic. And um, then, um, yeah, that's basically the key message. And later on, I argued a little how we are trying to move towards rigorously proving these things rather than only making formal as asymptotic arg arguments as important as they are for understanding the stuff. Um, right. And then now the uh, internal wave, sound wave, advection system is one of the type I showed you this picture in the first lecture where the fast process is actually oscillatory. The internal waves and the sound waves are highly oscillatory, similar to what um, Anne Lohr uh, uh, discussed this morning. That's one type of multi-scale problem that can arise when epsilon goes to zero. But there is another kind of system or pattern that emerges or can emerge depending on the parameter range. And I showed you that too for the linear oscillator problem. Namely, that was the case when the mass here parameter in the oscillator equation is much, much smaller than the damping, which still itself is also small. And in that case, you get a layer solution. You have a very rapid transition layer where the initial condition uh, basically gets reduced to some balanced state, and from then on everything is slow and re re settles towards the, the, um, the slowest time scale in the system. That's an initial layer problem. 
And this similar situations when you have, that's probably familiar to most of you, you go from the Euler equations in a closed system with rigid walls to the Navier-Stokes equations, then the boundary condition imposes a, um, is, is not, the boundary condition for Navier-Stokes is not compatible with that for Euler. In Navier-Stokes you have the no slip condition, in Euler you have a slip, and then if you switch on viscosity you get a boundary layer, so get a thin layer in space rather than in time, over which the solution adjusts from the incompatible boundary conditions to conditions that are close to what the Euler equations support. And the type of problem that I want to discuss today is of the um, layer type, so you have transitions between uh, parts of the domain where the solution has an asymptotically different behavior than in the rest of the domain. That's what I want to discuss now. So we then have two examples, one for, for oscillatory of yesterday and one for layer type solutions um, today. Right. Um, who of you knows what matched asymptotic expansions are? Ah, oh. one or two, okay. Let me give you a quick blackboard uh, example so we get an intuition for what I'm going to be doing next. Um, let's suppose we look at um, ut plus a u x is equal to epsilon u x x, right? So that's the advection diffusion equation. And let's suppose that um, x is in uh, 0, 1, and t is larger or equal to 0, and uh, a is positive, and it's constant. So it's the, really the simple most uh, setting we could think of. But of course, we are interested in epsilon being very small, and <coughs> the uh, we impose initial and boundary conditions in the following way. Uh, we let u of 0 and x to be some given u0 of x. We let um, u of t and 0, we impose at the left boundary some uh, profile in time of u, so that would be uh, u left of t. And we impose on the right edge, because we have two derivatives in space here, we can actually impose two boundary conditions at the left and right, for example, and we want to impose here that u of t and 1 is equal to 0, right? Now we do asymptotics, and we start with the naive single-scale asymptotics that only focuses on the original scales in time and space that are uh, represented already in the equation. So I let formally simply epsilon go to zero and see what happens, right? So formal asymptotics. Um, on the given time and length scale. We set epsilon to zero formally and we get ut plus a ux is equal to zero. That's the advection equation and we know how to solve it analytically by the method of characteristics. So the solution would do the following. If I go to an, a diagram of space and time, then here is one, here is zero. Then I have characteristic curves in this diagram, namely curves with dx dt equals a. And we know that the solution of the leading order equation, not rescaled in space or time, simply is advected along the characteristic path so that um, you uh, let me call it uh, O for outer solution of, no, um, U outer of T and X 
is simply uh, either u0 of um, x minus at for some condition, or it is uh, u left of um, um, t minus x over a. And what are the conditions? So obviously the argument of u0 has to be larger than 0. So that means for x minus at bigger than 0. And here we go uh, to the left boundary condition is valid only for t larger than 0. So starting from here, so we want to have t minus x over a bigger than 0. And the dividing line, of course, is this characteristic uh, where we have to switch from picking up initial values and carrying along the characteristic to picking up boundary values and carrying those along the characteristics. Is that all plausible? Any questions? Good. Now, obviously, we have a problem because if I'm arriving, I'm, I'm sitting on a characteristic, I'm arriving here, I carry my val initial value all the way to this point, and then generally this value will not be zero, so I cannot satisfy my boundary condition on the right. I have a problem, and that's to be fixed by matched asymptotic analysis as follows. So we have non-matching boundary values. And this is uh, the boundary values to be repaired by introducing, guess what, a boundary layer. As follows, and let me do this on the other blackboards. <clears throat> so it takes a little bit of fiddling until you find out that there is a region, a narrow region, of thickness, O of epsilon, within which the adjustment from the characteristic values that the leading order equation here prescribes to the right edge boundary value takes place. Why is it order epsilon and not order square root epsilon or some other power of epsilon? Um, let's us accept that for the moment that's the guess and see that it makes sense. And I leave it to you to figure out what would happen if you were, assume, were to assume a different scaling of the thickness of the layer. You will find out some things don't add up in the equation. You don't get a balance of the terms. Um, so let's do that. So we, we introduce a solution ansatz for the boundary layer. And that looks like this. So we say that u epsilon of tx is equal to, let me call it a capital U. It also should depend on t. We are not introducing a new time, but only a new length scale. And let me put it as x minus 1 over epsilon. Right? So the coordinate here, let me call it xi. This xi coordinate is going to be negative in the domain. And when xi is 0, we have reached the right edge of the boundary layer, right? So uh, xi equals 0 is corresponding to x equal 1. Um, and that's our right edge boundary. OK, let's see what happens if we take the derivatives and put it into the equation. We get u epsilon t is simply ut, we get u epsilon x is equal to 1 over epsilon u sub xi, and 
um, u epsilon xx is equal to 1 epsilon squared u xi xi, and we insert all this in our, into our equation. And we get at leading order, uh, no, we, we get the following, we get um, ut plus 1 over epsilon a u xi is equal to, now we had one prefactor epsilon, in the original equation we have a 1 over epsilon squared from the chain rule, so we get in fact 1 over epsilon um, u sub xi xi. Ah, okay, now we take the order epsilon, uh, 1 over epsilon terms, collect, I, I spare myself writing down the asymptotic expansion with u0 plus epsilon u1, etc. We have seen it before. I just pick out the leading order uh, equation and obviously it reads as a u xi is equal to u xi xi which we can actually solve for u xi, it's a first order ODE for the u xi, right? And so that means we have u xi is equal to um, some u xi comma uh, zero times exponent of a uh, xi. Um, and if I actually integrate, um, no, that should be right. That should be correct. Okay. And that means that um, u itself, u comes out to be, um, integrate this. So it's uh, u um, zero plus u xi comma zero. And I integrate this over a um, exponent e to the a xi minus one, if I haven't made a mess. Okay, good. Now we, now we can t take the situation where xi is zero, that is the um, right edge, and obviously that term goes away, so u zero remains. Um, and that means since we have the boundary condition that at the right edge our solution should vanish, we say um, at xi equals zero, x equals one, and that means u zero is gone, and we know the solution now up to this prefactor, right? And so here we go, we have um, u, of t xi is equal to u xi zero over a times um, e to the a xi minus one. So have I done everything correctly? Um, this goes to, uh -huh. yes, that should all be, yes, good. All right, so what do we have? We have now um, this part of the solution in the main uh, largest part of the def domain of definition of the problem. We have simply the characteristic solution described this way. And then we have this layer here where the solution exponentially go, um, or approaches zero at the end and exponentially um, approaches minus the prefactor uh, farther away. So let me sketch for any t larger than zero what's, what would be happening. We would have um, in terms of u, we would have um, some values that have been carried along the characteristic and we have an, a layer solution that does something. Let me suppose for a moment that u sub xi at zero would be positive, just for the heck of it, right? Then, as xi goes to minus infinity, this guy goes away and we end up with something that looks like, um, um, let me think, it's zero here, it comes out like, <laughs> 
um, th this asymptotically. So that obviously doesn't make any sense. We would have a break in the solution. And we fix that by requiring that this value, which is imposed by the characteristics from the outer solution, matches what happens asymptotically as we go uh, to infinity from, uh, from the inside of the layer. So we want this value, U capital U, um, xi to minus infinity, to be equal to U outer of t and 1. Yeah, and if we do so, then what, we, what happens is that basically we carry the solution to here. That solution does something like this. And we get something that looks like, at least to leaving order, a continuous solution that um, we can make sense of. And in fact, there is methods that I don't have the time to go into now to construct out of these two separate representations in two different coordinates, one uniformly valid solution that you can then use as your leading order approximation. Typically, what happens is you do the expansions, say, to leading and first order here, and also to leading and first order here, and in, this, in some transition region that has a, a certain thickness of for example, square root of epsilon instead of epsilon, you lose a little bit of accuracy. The, you don't have the same error estimate in the transition region between the two as you have it in each individual layer. But you can nevertheless construct a continuously differentiable solution that uh, is valid throughout the domain. The key point is, to summarize, <clears throat> in matched asymptotic expansions, you slice up space or time, or both, into subdomains that are re represented by rescaled coordinates, inside of which you get separate reduced equation sets for your, from, derived from your original equations, which are hopefully easier to solve than the full, full ones. You solve those equations, and then there is an overlap region in which, and this is why it's called matched asymptotics, in which, you require for, in which you require that the solution from one side looks like the solution from the other side, and they're compatible with each other. This typically fixes degrees of freedom, such as this one, which was open when we did the integration here. We, we didn't have this. Uh, up here, it's still unknown. But once we require that the inner and the outer solution match, fix, fit together, we can eliminate these open degrees of freedom. That I will refer back to later on in a more complicated situation, and it gives us a very interesting piece of information on hurricanes, as you will see. Okay? Any questions as far as this is concerned? Okay. Then, let's move on. <clears throat> Now I get into the topic I wanted to present to you uh, very much. I, this is my most exciting project at this time. It's about strongly tilted atmospheric vortices with hurricanes or um, typhoons in the back of my mind. Um, this is, again, cooperation with a lot of people. Here we have our PhD students and postdocs first, and then Sabine Hittmeyer is now a professor at uh, Vienna University. Piotr, I mentioned him yesterday. Buolam Kuide is at the University of Victoria. And Mike Montgomery and Roger Smith are a inseparable pair of researchers in hurricane science. And Mike Montgomery was uh, one of the referees we had to battle in the first publication on this. And we learned a lot from him. And in the end, we, we remain friends, and the paper is published. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, here we go. So I start with, again with a motivation. I discuss um, the content of this paper that I mentioned, where Mike was a referee from 2012 in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. 
And then I'll give a, a very brief four slide outlook on what's coming and what we're working on in my scaling cascades thing right now. Um, right. So the motivation is as follows. This is the uh, southern part of the Atlantic. This is Africa and here are the Atlas Mountains. And it's, it so happens that from the Atlas Mountains you have a continuous stream of what is called baroclinic waves. That's a mixture of a, um, a Rossby wave that's induced by the variation of the Coriolis parameter in the north-south direction and the internal waves that I discussed yesterday. They are combining in a certain way and they, they can be, go unstable. And then they fold over and they form in the middle latitudes. In our mid latitudes, they form the typical weather patterns, the high and low pressure regions that we know of. Right? They begin as Rossby waves or Rossby gravity waves, and then they become unstable, they roll up, and then you have this rotating pattern that we know as a high or low pressure region. The same thing happens here, except these waves travel the other direction. They go from Africa towards America. And um, when you, uh, like Tim Dunkerton and colleagues, jump on a coordinate frame that moves with any one of such baroclinic un, uh, baroclinically unstable waves, and you monitor in a strong case of folding, you monitor the vorticity, that's the color code basically, um, you find that the vorticity concentrates um, in almost circular patterns. So that's the first sign that something like a vortex is forming. Again, in the same picture, you can plot the velocity, the horizontal velocity, minus the mean velocity of the uh, traveling wave pattern. And for that velocity, plot the streamlines. And what you find is these spiraling patterns here. Um, that, again, is a different signal that uh, a vortex is forming. In this situation, the Rossby number that we have heard about a couple of times meanwhile is still very small. And that's the regime where Anlaw told us about the quasi-geostrophic equations yesterday. That's where these equations basically hold. So this is still all described by quasi-geostrophic theory. If, however, you go to a full-fledged hurricane, like Hurricane Rita here, um, 2006 or something, um, you look at the radius of maximum wind, which is then only about 200 kilometers instead of 500 kilometers here. Um, and you look at the maximum wind speed, which is no longer between 5 and 10 meters per second, but now it's between 30 and 60 meters per second, and you form again the Rossby number, it comes out 10. So we have moved from a limit regime where the Rossby number is very small, to another limit regime where the Rossby number is large. So the, this, in between, something interesting must be happening. And in fact, the transition between the two is what currently excites those researchers in this field most, because both the other limits are rather well understood and can be simulated with computer codes rather well. The transition still makes problems, because they have sometimes situations where a baroclinic wave doesn't do anything. It just goes away again or it forms a storm for a while, but it doesn't become very violent, and then it decays again, or it suddenly shoots up within hours to become a hurricane, and things in between. So that transition is not very, very well understood. There isn't really a very good theory for it yet. And it's this transition from low Rossby to large Rossby numbers. Here is a set of pictures, graphics, that I got from Gus Alaka um, this year when Tom Dörfel, my PhD student, and I visited the Hurricane Research Division of uh, the National Oceanograph Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, in Florida. And they were all excited about what I'm going to show you later because of these observations that they made very recently. The observation was this. There was this storm, Joaquin, and there's similar ones, 
the track of which is very difficult to predict by numerical simulations. So this picture here shows in the um, east, west, north, south um, coordinate system, it sh and here is Florida. It shows tracks of the hurricane as simulated by their standard prediction, weather prediction code, with in each track has slightly different initial data. And as you can see, the spread of the predicted path of the hurricane is, is huge, right? It, it either enters uh, here in Carolina or it goes all the way up to, uh, to Canada, or it even branches off and goes towards Europe. But that's a very unsatisfactory situation, and one would like to know what are the sensitivities, where is this coming from? Now, what they observed by doing these runs and uh, uh, observing closely what are the consequences of choosing different parameters in the initial data, they observed that in this region there is a band in space, under this, in, in this time, at the time of beginning of the simulation, where it so happens that depending on where you place the hurricane in this region, and on the internal structure of the vortex at the beginning, it either branches to the left or uh, to the right or to the left, whereas if you place the initial vortex outside of this band, basically left of it, everybody goes left, right of it, everybody goes right. So they say region in between where the hurricane becomes, the track of the hurricane becomes very sensitive to the initial data. That's an observation they had. The second observation is that um, is, is color-coded in these pictures. So what this picture says is, is the following. Gus took um, at various points in time, each circle is a point in time, he took, um, the, he took, no, that's not true, this is, this is, uh, the circle is, each circle is a different height, whereas the entire picture is for a given time step, namely the initial time. Um, so every circle represents at a certain height the center of the vorticity distribution. Okay, so what we have is almost axisymmetric vortices at every horizontal slice, but when you move vertically from one slice to the other, the center of the distribution is displaced. So that makes a curve in space, and these, the connection of these circles here is basically the center line. It's, an, it's a projection of the center line onto the horizontal plane. So what you see here is strongly tilted vortices because one degree is about 100 kilometers, so the tilt between the bottom of the vortex and um, the, the center at the top of the troposphere is 100 kilometers apart in this, in this picture. Okay, and they show, they, they, he found, Gus found that depending on the tilt of the vortex, very different things would happen to the track, whereas the position of the vortex within the band was much less important for predicting what the track would do. So there must be some intrinsic dynamics that couples the tilt of the vortex to the overall path, and that was something they found out by observing uh, these, or analyzing very closely these simulations only very recently. Okay, that's the motivation, and here comes the, in the overview of the paper that we did, structure of atmospheric vortices. Um, as I said before, we are interested now in the transition from small Rossby to large Rossby number, and naturally you jump in the middle and say, let me analyze things for my epsilon going to zero, but everything set up says that for the vortex, the Rossby number is order one. Then I'm in the middle and I can basically go in, in, in the direction of one and the other limiting case. What does the Rossby number actually tell us, physically speaking? Uh, it's, it, we introduced it, as a dimensionless parameter, one of the, the many ones that comes out of the dimensional analysis, but physically speaking, what it says for a vortex is, well, in the geostrophic regime, with small Rossby number, the radial pressure gradient, so radial pressure gradient, balances essentially the Coriolis force, and nobody else plays a role at leading order. 
That's the geostrophic balance. When the Rossby number is large, in contrast, the radial pressure gradient is all covered up by the centrifugal force that you get due to the rotation of parcels around the center. And then obviously the Rossby order one regime, which is when you divide F u by uh, u theta squared over r, you actually get the Rossby number, or one over Rossby number. Um, so in this regime, all the three terms are of equal importance. And now it becomes clear that when you go to somewhat larger velocities, then this guy wins because he, he grows as a u theta squared. And for smaller velocities, it loses. And this guy wins uh, because it's linear in, in u. So this is how you make the transition between the two. And we wanted an asymptotic uh, analysis of the vortex dynamics for Ros vortex Rossby numbers of order unity. Oh, going back to here, let me show you another picture of Dunkerton and colleagues where they emphasize already early on or show, without emphasizing it in the paper, they show in a, in a graph that the tilt of the vortex can be really big. So this is a, another picture of theirs in a similar moving frame of reference, moving with the baroclinic instability. And they show here the velocity potential for the divergence, horizontal divergence of the velocity field. When the, um, the, the dashed lines here in, indicate that the divergence is negative, so mass comes in. And the solid lines indicate at high altitudes that the divergence is positive, so the mass goes out. So in this situation, they have near one kilometer height, they have an inflow, and near 12 kilometer height, they have an outflow. And these are represented by reasonably circular patterns of in and outflow at different heights. But when you look at what is the eyeballing, the center of this pattern at one kilometer, the red dot here, and what is the center of the pattern at 12 kilometer height, the red dot in this one, and you check, it's actually 200 kilometers apart. This is quite dramatic in comparison with all the papers on hurricane theory. Typically what's done is, let's assume there is a vortex that's almost upright and has a small perturbation away from the vertical. And then you, you do linearized analysis and you study what happens in the equations, but here, we have a vortex that's 12 kilometer high and has 100 kilometers separation, or even 200. So it's very strongly tilted. Nobody looked at that before us in the 2012 paper, where we actually do that. So what's the construction? We set up, and here we go, matched asymptotic analysis. We set up a, an asymptotic expansion scheme, or a solution ansatz, where um, away from a vortex, we assume quasi-geostrophic theory, so the Rossby number is small, as in Anlor's talk. And we basically assume that far in the far field, the quasi-geostrophic theory holds. Then we embed into this a, quotes, thin vortex on a smaller scale that is almost axisymmetric at every height, but we allow the center of the axisymmetry to be aligned along a curve, we call it the center line, that may evolve in time. So we have a meandering vortex that can move along, and it's always narrow compared to this synoptic scale. Um, that's the philosophical idea. But now we have to get to the right scalings in terms of epsilon, right? It's distinguished limits are all important, as you know. And now we need a distinguished limit for the thickness of the hurricane and for the level of velocity that we have inside. And there's a very nice physical argument that I'm going to make to you in order to show that um, the, the limits and scales you pick, they don't fall from the sky and you don't have to be basically um, inspired by uh, the Lord or somebody. Uh, to, to find those. The, the equations and the physics tell you basically what is the right uh, limit and combinations of limit to take. And let me argue how you get to this here and how we, how we found the scalings for the inner part of the vortex. So outside we have Rossby number order epsilon, that's small, and we have a circulation 
That is whatever it is. It's the typical outer velocity times the circumference of diameter um, of a circle of diameter synoptic scale uh, around the vortex. That's the circulation. Now there is uh, the um, Helmholtz circulation, uh, the Kelvin, is it Kelvin or Helmholtz? Kelvin circulation theorem. It says take a line of particles in a fluid that have a certain circulation. So the integral C, the circulation C is the integral around a closed curve, let me call it L, of the velocity dot ds. That's the circulation. And L is a function of time, and it's always made up by definition of the same particles. So you follow the curve as the particles get advected by the flow, and you calculate the circulation at any time, and then Helmholtz tells you um, that that C of t is actually a constant in frictionless flow. And the, the flow here doesn't have dominant friction, so at least the order of magnitude of the circulation should be, should be preserved. Now, the next observation is that most of the theories on hurricane amplification work this way. They say there is the tea leaf effect. You know what the tea leaf effect is? You learn about it tomorrow from Anlor, the uh, Ekman layer. Um, so suppose you have a cup of tea with a few tea leaves left inside, and they sink down to the bottom. Now you stir. When you stir, the tea leaves end up in the middle of the, uh, of the cup. Always. The reason is, when you stir, you, the fluid rotates, you establish a radial pressure gradient, Pressure is minimum in the, in the center and it's maximum outside. That radial pressure gradient is balanced by the centrifugal force completely in most of the cup. However, at the ground, the friction comes in and it slows down the circumferential motion and so therefore the pressure gradient, which is then imposed on the boundary layer, has to be cup, picked up by viscous friction. But the viscous, viscous friction force has to be in the same direction as the pressure gradient, so it's radial. And that means you set up a radial inflow. And that radial inflow pushes the leaves into the center. That's what's happening in, at the bottom of a hurricane as well. And so the folklore says the rotation of, um, of Earth, the, represented by the Coriolis parameter, is, um, uh, sets up a circulation in the far field. That circulation is essentially constant as mass is moving inwards in the boundary layer. And however, we know from the ice skating, the pirouette effect in ice skating, if you start out rotating slowly with your arms stretched out, you, um, you, rot you keep rotating slowly, but if you pull in your arms, you spin up. Circulation conservation, right? If this, the curve concentrates onto a short length, you only can keep the circulation by increasing the velocity accordingly. So that's why the vortex spins up. So we wanted to be able, in our theory, to capture this effect because that's the, what everybody believes in is the main, the dominant driving force for spin up of hurricanes. So what we want is that the vortex theory, the inner part, the inner solution of the vortex, has the same level of circulation as the outer part. Ha! Huh. And at the same time, we want the, Ros, the vortex Rossby number to be order one, as I defined before. So we have two relationships that define uh, the velocity level and the length scale of the inner solution. Well, it can, the calculation is easy. We want to be the, the we want the um, um, circulation to be the same as as outside. So when the velocity goes up, the length has to go go down, and we want the um, the uh, Rossby number to go from epsilon to one, and that means you have to rescale velocity and length by um, one over square root of epsilon for velocity and square root of epsilon for length. And then you can satisfy both conditions. So that settles very cleanly what's the radial distance you have to allow for the size of the vortex and what you have to allow for the circumferential velocity in terms of magnitude in comparison to the far field. So that sets up 
the asymptotics, and from there, it all is matched asymptotics, just as I showed you for the simple advection diffusion example before. And now I'm going to only count the result and tell you about those. What you see here is the analog of the determination of the slope at uh, zero of our inner solution here, which was a free parameter. In the matched asymptotics for the vortex, what happens is you, you jump onto the center line, you do everything in a moving frame of reference, you get a theory for the relative motion between the center of the vortex and the swirling flow. That leaves you a degree of freedom for the absolute velocity of what's the motion, the, what's the speed at which the vortex moves, the center line moves. Now, when you match to the far field, where there is no center line, it's the absolute velocity in the environment, you have to match. The velocity fields have to be compatible with each other, and that, in fact, settles in the matching procedure the dx dt, where x, as a function of time and the vertical, is the representation of the center line. So this is coming from the matching condition, and this uh, equation of motion for the center line has a couple of interesting terms. This one is trivial. It's due to the background advection. So if you have a, a wind blowing in the background, it basically blows the, the vortex along. But there is two terms that have to do with the vortex itself, the structure of the inner solution. One has to do with the total circulation of the vortex and the geometry of the center line. The other is more interesting. It has to do with the geometry of the uh, vortex um, with diabatic source terms, meaning heating or cooling or latent heat release of condensation and things like that, and with the core structure, which is synonymous to the radial distribution of the swirling velocity. So there's a really non-trivial coupling between the swirling velocity and the motion of the vortex and the tilt, the center line geometry. That's something that Gus Alakas said, ah, we were looking for a connection like that, because we now know that when the vortex gets tilted one way or the other, initially it moves here or it moves there, meaning they get an impact onto the motion of the center line of the vortex from the geometry the, uh, in both terms and also from the core structure. So that's a very nice result. If this is just integrals. It wouldn't help if, if I show, you, show them to you. Um, the next thing is we said, let's suppose there is no heating term, and we try to check our asymptotic theory against three-dimensional simulation with, uh, uh, I forgot to mention, Piotr Smolakiewicz's Eulag uh, code. Then you find this is, there is, there is eigenmodes of the center line that look almost like a sine cosine function that do just a precession, uh, like a topspin that you can run on a, on a table. And so they precess around at constant frequency. And the Euler scheme in three dimensional simu simulations, when it's set up to reproduce this dynamics, it does that very well with errors of the order of, uh, something like 10% here in the precession frequency. And when you look at what our expansion parameter is, um, epsilon, epsilon is about a tenth from yesterday's talk, and square, or uh, the day before, and square root of epsilon is about a third. So we are basically stretching the regimes of asymptotics. The, when epsilon is a third and we get an error of only a tenth, that looks rather good to us. Okay, we were happy with that. And now we move on to um, the evolution of the core structure. And let me uh, briefly walk you through the, con the, the physical connections that, that make up finally the exciting result that I'm, that I'm trying to get to. So in what follows, the next two slides, um, uh, we do Fourier decompositions in the circumferential angle. So think of a coordinate system that sits on the center line, and we do a polar coordinates around the center in each horizontal slice. So an index zero is the leading order Fourier mode. It's the circumferential average. Index one one is the cosine component. Index one two is the sine component. And then there's higher Fourier modes, which we never need in this context. Okay? Then, the geostrophic balance, no, the gradient wind balance, 
Rossby order one is this that was expected sort of by design of how we set up the asymptotics that had to come out at leading order, radial pressure gradient has to match the centrifugal plus the Coriolis force. Very well. Then this equation here is hydrostatics. Remember the vortex is a flat pancake and when you do a, an expansion in the aspect ratio, we saw that in Ann Laura's talk also, you do the aspect ratio asymptotics and at leading order you get hydrostatics. Basically the pressure, vertical pressure gradient balances the density force, the, gra uh, the, the force of gravity due to density distributions. That's the imprint of that and the potential temperature first Fourier mode perturbation in a tilted vortex is simply induced, uh, is the induced buoyancy perturbation that comes from the fact that you have a axisymmetric pressure distribution that is tilted in the vertical, right? If you have a, an axisymmetric pressure here and an axisymmetric pressure here, they are tilted relative to each other. If you look top down, you see a Fourier mode one perturbation from going from one level to the other. And that Fourier mode one perturbation of the pressure field comes with a Fourier mode one of the potential temperature that's responsible for adjusting the density so everything remains hydrostatic. But at the same time, we know the potential temperature satisfies the advection equation and that's this equation here. Time derivatives are small because we look at very slow evolution in time. So this term here is the vertical advection of the background stratification of potential temperature responsible, for example, for gravity waves, as we, as we know now. Um, this is a source term from heating that we uh, impose externally in this theory at this level. Um, so that, imp it change, that can change potential temperature too, of course, when you heat or cool uh, diabatically. Um, and this term here is the result of um, taking circumferential advection of the first Fourier mode. Right? So if you have, for example, um, d, d theta in the uh, d d phi in the circumferential direction um, of the potential temperature, when it's a cosine, you generate a um, minus sine, and if it's a sine uh, a component, you generate a cosine, and this is why the k star appears here as the, the flipped one. Um, um, sine if it's if uh, we are looking at k representing the cosine and and uh, minus sine in the other case so that's an, a second equation we get for the potential temperature dis, uh, perturbation and out of the two we can ex extract the vertical velocity very simply by rearranging the formulas and inserting what we know from here for the first Fourier mode an interesting equation comes up that has two components one is simply due to the fact that the vortex is tilted and has, has the hydrostatic and uh, ra um, gradient wind balance in the pressure field. That's this one. Notice that it's proportional to the 90 degree rotated tilt. So the vertical velocity first Fourier mode is rotated 90 degree to the tilt of the vortex. And then there is another component that comes simply from the fact that we heat or cool. And you can see it from here when you divide by the stratification there is a comp component of W that's simply proportional to the heating or cooling, and that's, that's, that's this term. So why is all this important? It becomes important when you look at the, ax the circumferential momentum balance. So now we are at the interesting point. Now we see how the intensification takes place. So U theta is the circumferential wind speed, so it's the intensity of the vortex. And here is the evolution equation. Um, these terms are all basically due to the axisymmetric, uh, the momentum balance in the circumferential direction in an axisymmetric vortex. That's not so interesting at this point. The point, the term on the right hand side is interesting. It's, my, it's, it's a positive factor in a cyclone that moves in this, rotates in the same direction as the Earth rotation. So this here is a, um, a positive factor multiplied by some kind of apparent radial velocity, you, you are star, and that turns out to be the circumferential average of the vertical velocity that we saw on the other slide times the tilt vector. And if you recall what WK, uh, 1K was, and you observe that this here is DDZ of the um, 
tilt vector rotated by 90 degrees, you multiply that by the tilt vector itself, you get products of sine times cosine, they average to zero, that guy has no influence, but if you look at that term, it can produce a non-zero average um, against the tilt, and that in fact is what happens. So the UR star is um, the, basically the product of two vectors. One is the tilt vector, the sloping uh, center line vector, and the other one is the dipole of heating um, that is uh, determined by the sine-cosine components of, of, of the heating pattern. So depending on whether you arrange the heating dipole with the tilt or against the tilt, you can actually make a positive or negative UR star, and this can spin up or slow down the vortex. And that was a mechanism nobody had on the radar screen. Um, it's not the same as just sucking in air and making the pirouette spin up uh, near the ground and pushing it out at the bottom. It's a different mechanism. And uh, here you can see from simulations that the predictions very nicely pan out, namely here is the um, a simulation from Sarah Jones in 95, um, where you see the tilt vector, I plotted it here from extracting data from her publication, this is the tilt vector in this situ situation, and the vertical velocity dipole is in fact rotated by 90 degrees very nicely relative to the tilt. And the potential temperature perturbation, again, is aligned, or anti-aligned, actually, against uh, the tilt vector. So you have a, the, the dipole for potential temperature perturbation points in this way, and the tilt points the other way. That is what happens when you have no heating. But now, there is a theory by Edward Lawrence, and that's coming here, um, in 1955, where he says, hmm, we have the situation that we release latent heat from condensation all the time, and we observe that it produces storms. The latent heat con of condensation is a thermodynamic process. It changes entropy, or temperature if you want. So how does this temperature change induce kinetic energy, mechanical energy? It's not obvious. And he found out, by basically theoretical arguments, that um, if you take a given field of the atmospheric flow, you subtract out large-scale mean values, and you heat wherever the potential temperature has a positive perturbation, and you cool where it has a negative perturbation, that's where you generate mechanical energy. Not immediately kinetic energy, but you generate first potential energy. And that potential energy is then available to be reshuffled by the flow and turned into kinetic later on. So this was his APE theory, APE theory, the Available Potential Energy Theory, in 1955. And this would mean here in the, our, uh, if we take small heating perturbations as a, as a first ansatz, then we would have to heat um, in the back of the vortex and cool in the front of the vortex. We looked at our theory again, and the theory actually predicts nicely that whenever we have this alignment of heating and potential temperature perturbations, this is the asymmetric parts as, dipole, as a scalar product of dipole vectors, or we heat axisymmetrically wherever there is a positive pot potential temperature anomaly or perturbation um, around the vortex, then we can actually produce kinetic energy. That's the complete kinetic energy balance for our vortex. And the intermediate storage in potential energy actually is pushed under the rug because we look at long time scales where that has already happened by gravity wave dispersion. So th that matches nicely with this uh, uh, available potential energy um, theory and that uh, thanks to Olivier Paulouis who pointed us to that question to just dig into our theory and find out how it relates to this established Lorentz theory, uh, it is very highlighting. So we are thankful to Olivier to have pointed us to in, in that direction. But the other result of this equation here is that the symmetric heating and the asymmetric one are equally important. They appear at the same order in the asymptotics. So it's, it's nothing like, yeah, the non-axisymmetric parts could be negligible, 
uh, they do higher order effects, but the axisymmetric heating is what really spins up the vortex. Not true, they're both equally important. Um, here's actually um, the, um, um, an explanation of the mechanism, um, and yeah, I can actually do that. So it turns out the, uh, the mechanism is very similar to what I said before, the circulation conservation, except that it doesn't come from a systematic, what is called secondary circulation, where mass comes in near the ground and gets moved out at the top. It's much more local. The effect is much more local. So look at, for example, a tilted vortex. This is the imprint of the center line. And this is a, con this is a control volume. Think of it as a little cylinder, a tilted cylinder around the center line. If we now heat at the back of the vortex, we induce, um, by the heating pattern, we induce a vertical velocity that drives mass out of the control volume. If 90, uh, 180 degrees later, we cool the vortex, just as we had it with the dipole pattern, then the mass wants to sink and it again moves out of the uh, control volume. Since mass has to be conserved on average, the, it has to come from somewhere, and in fact, there's a, mass, a radial inflow, that's the UR star, that's produced by the systematic drain of mass, and so mass is dragged in from larger distances, and that's the period effect that happens at every level. And mass is not systematically come in here, goes out there, but it's actually redistributed between layers, right? Here the mass goes up, here the mass goes down. It's redistributed between layers, and the missing mass in the middle is pulled in from the side. And that's the mechanism that, that is due to this asymmetric heating in interaction with the tilt. And here is a simulation that Tom Dörfel did to see whether we could spin up a vortex this way, again with the Euler 3D code. He set it up like a nicely tilted vortex with no heating to begin with. It started precessing. And then he took that term, which is basically due to the adiabatic, simply tilted hydrostatic geostrophic balance situation. He took that term, added it again, and rotated it by 90 degrees, which would be the maximum heating direction that you could get. And then you can see, in fact, this, the, in, in, uh, in about 12 hours, 15 hours or 12 hours, the vortex spins up from 30, uh, 10 to 30 meters per second speed. So it's a very rapid amplification that, in fact, you can achieve by that mechanism. Right. Um, so that's the content of this paper. And of course, Time has gone by and we started getting to be more curious about a couple of things that we were pushing under the rug in the first shot. Namely, all the other multi-scale effects that come in. Currently, we are looking only at two scales, right? We look at the large quasi-geostrophic scale and then the vortex scale. But in a real vortex, you also have a boundary layer underneath and you also have convection, meaning that mass that's moving inwards by the tea leaf effect has to go somewhere. So where does it go? It has to come out of the boundary layer. Then in these vortices, in the, in the typical stratified atmosphere in the tropics, or the subtropics, you have a certain level of height. It's called the level of free convection. And when saturated air, water saturated air, makes it across that level, then it starts condensating water and so much so that it becomes positively buoyant relative to its environment. Positively buoyant means it now gets a, an upward forcing by the gravity forces and the, the, the mass shoots up. In fact, there's so much of this potential buoyance, buoyancy force that this um, convectively available potential energy, CAPE, um, if you take the square root of that, it, it boils down to this scale of vertical velocities being of the order of 10 to 50 meters per second. Very violent updrafts that you get. Now, what does it mean? If you want mass conservation for the lifting air, you have to balance the mean updraft here, which is at the order of sub one meter per second, typically a couple of tens of centimeters per second, mean upward motion from the boundary layer. It gets turned into updrafts, concentrated narrow updrafts that shoot up at much, much larger velocities. 
to make that happen, the updrafts have to be very small in area. Otherwise, you would get a, don't get a mass balance, right? Because a very small, I'm looking at it from the top here, very small area of updrafts with high velocities match with the mean vertical mass flux that comes out of the boundary layer over the entire region. So here's another multi-scale effect, or two already, right? The, the, the second we have is the boundary layer versus the rest of the bulk. And the third that we have is the ensemble of narrow updrafts as they interact to produce some mean effect. So two more multi-scale effects of interest that we can do asymptotics on. And we have done quite a bit of it already. And the, let me just summarize um, one main result that made us very happy and which we didn't expect in this way. Namely, remember the UR star in this acceleration of circumferential motion equation. This UR star was the circumferential average of the vertical velocity times the tilt vector. And then I argued the vertical velocity component that is responsible for making a non-zero average is, is coming just from the heating, and then we got a result on the arrangement of, of tilt and heating dipoles. But the primary variable is actually the mass flux. So it so happens if you do the multi-scale theory for an ensemble of, of updrafts in this situation, you can do an, an average again over the area, and what happens is you get the same expression, but now it's the mean mass flux in the updrafts that Fourier, gets Fourier decomposed and whose dipole vector matches against the tilt vector and produces exactly the same effect that we had before. So we, we didn't have to go back and basically do tediously the whole vortex theory. It was, it's, it's sufficient to simply replace that bracket here by whatever we get as an ensemble average over many, many narrow updrafts in terms of a mean mass flux. And that's a, an exciting result because it means we can reuse all the other work. It's a, the JFM paper has about 50, 40 pages of derivation, so we wouldn't have liked to redo all this. Um, here we go. So that's the main result. And so we, we are now working actively on the boundary layer theory here and on uh, with Sabine Hitmeyer on getting more details about the, the updraft towers where there's a lot of theory to be done, again, with nice asymptotics and distinguished limits and scaling regimes and what have you. Um, okay, and that basically, leave, let me leave that out. Um, that gets me to my conclusions for today. Um, I gave you a motivation that there is something not well understood in hur hurricane amplification, that somehow a little bit by incidence we stumbled over exactly the right asymptotics that would capture the transition regime between quasi-geostrophic balance at the beginning and um, the cyclostrophic balance with large Rossby numbers at the end. And we have followed up with 3D simulations to uh, verify that at least the dynamics isn't all completely off the track. And we are looking at multi-scale effects of more sophisticated and realistic nature and seem to find that the bulk of the theory holds up and we just have to feed in more of the details to get a closed, uh, consistent picture. Right, and that uh, brings me to the end, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. So we have time for, plenty, for a lot of questions. Yeah. Okay. In your uh, ensemble average in the end, so do you write a kind of stochastic model for the evolution, or is it uh, random initial data? How, how does it work? Basically, so far what we have assumed is um, that the individual towers are separated far enough from each other so that they have individual dynamics and they only weakly interact. And the argument is that you can make it by an, an so, an area ratio argument, they have to be basically diameter epsilon and distance square root of epsilon. So then it all If you have that, then um, yes, we want a stochastic model. We don't have one yet. But if you only know this much, as I just said, then you can already draw the conclusions that I did. So now part of what we are doing with the boundary layer theory is to try to find arguments of what sets up the statistics of the convection. 
to find a stochastic model that fires them continuously. But we, we aren't there yet. Other questions? Uh, here. Uh. <clears throat> uh, I was wondering, in the gradual momentum balance, could there be um, some contribution from the Coriolis force on the vertical velocity as well, since they seem to be quite important at that point? Uh, um, what we see in the, in the asymptotics for the individual towers is in fact um, that the vertical velocity induces Coriolis effects in the horizontal. Okay. So basically we get little dipoles, yeah. vortices in the towers. That's right, okay. we see that. Uh -huh. Because in none of the equation that you have written, I could see any contribution for the Coriolis on the vertical velocity. Yeah, that's so, true. Uh, yes, it's true. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. okay. it, they, they, they appear, <laughs> these <Okay>. terms. <laughs> Okay. I have a general question. Uh, do we understand uh, uh, dissipation phenomena uh, in atmos atmospheric flows? Uh, because you talk about transfer, uh, it transfer into uh, energy, uh, into uh, kinetic energy. Do we understand how energy is dissipated uh, in atmospheric flows? Or? Basically, the, the what, what I'm saying here is what meteorologists discuss quite a bit is the, the transfers of energy that happen at a scale that you can resolve in a numerical model where things are essentially smooth. And then it's clear that you transfer energy also to kinetic energy and then when you are at small enough scales this goes into turbulence and then all hell breaks loose and then there is dissipation in the, at the end. But what, the, what seems or has turned out to be extremely important for the meteorological models and improved the quality a lot was to, disc to create discretizations that would do on the largest resolved scales very accurately the transfers between potential energy, kinetic energy and internal energy as you have them in the, in the Euler equations. Um, and then you need to make sure that at the smallest scales the numerics is stable. Uh, but how the details of dissipation take place, I don't think anybody knows, because it's a question of turbulence. Okay, so let's thank Roberto. Thank you. Thank you.